and I'd like to give the floor to you. Okay, you are, thank you very much uh, for that kind uh, rendition of uh, um, a jack of all trades, if you will, and a master of none. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I initially wrote this paper uh, on the UN Global Compact for Migration and the Globalization of uh, Border Controls for a uh, February 2020 uh, seminar at Columbia University. But then I put it aside as I found myself increasingly focused, may I say obsessed um, with various projects dealing with a contagious disease and, and global mobility. Um, today's presentation though, I view it as a, a welcome return to pre-COVID research uh, preoccupations. And I really wanna thank you all for this opportunity um, to uh, share it with you and get some, some feedback. Now, the UN Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration is a collective commitment that 152 uh, member states made in 2018 to improving international cooperation on migration. Now, I argue that the Global Compact for Migration expands multilateral cooperation on border controls in a way that furthers the globalization of border controls that I argue has occurred as states increasingly um, inspect incoming travelers before they cross territorial uh, boundaries. So just think of it this way, um, just as the globalization of production means you know, firms are moving their uh, production capabilities or factories to other countries outside of the state in which the headquarters are, are located. Well, the globalization of border control refers to states pushing out border control activities beyond their territorial borders. And this is mostly by leveraging new technologies, data collection, analysis that is used to screen incoming cargo and travelers before they arrive. Now, a state may unilaterally push borders out in this way through electronic data collection uh, for more effective targeting travelers for additional screening. But this kind of uh, globalization of a state's border controls is really limited to the amount of data that uh, states can unilaterally collect from inbound travelers and the airlines. Now, bilateral and multilateral cooperation among states to verify travelers' identities and share traveler data dramatically increases the amount and quality, very importantly, quality of data available for targeting analysis. So the Global Compact for Migration is a major step in the development of such multilateral cooperation to secure travel. So I, I make this argument in four steps. First, I lay the groundwork by describing global mobility and explaining states border control policies and uh, the enforcement of those policies in general terms. Second, I reviewed the discussion of borders within debates over globalization and state sovereignty in order to reconceptualize contemporary border control. Third, I explain how states are cooperating to secure international travel and to push their border controls beyond their territorial boundaries. Fourth, I explain how the Global Compact expands the scope of this cooperation and further globalizes border controls. And I finally conclude with some thoughts on potential consequences of this cooperation. So, whoop, what did I do? Can you share your screen again? Oh yeah. You need to share your screen on Zoom though. Did I let you? Yes. I must.
I think I'm going to use the little buttons here. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Sorry about that, folks out there. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> the world has about 281 million international migrants, uh, defined by the UN as those who have lived outside of their country of birth or nationality for more than a year. In contrast the, to this UN definition of migration, global mobility uh, refers to the movements of people across international borders for any length of time or, or purpose. Uh, the UN Global, sorry, the UN World Tourism Organization estimated that in uh, 2019, there were 1.4 billion international tourist arrivals, which includes travel for leisure, business, and to visit friends and relatives. Now, due to the coronavirus pandemic, uh, tourist arrivals dropped down to 400 uh, million in 2020. Now, additionally, there are millions of students and temporary contract workers who stay for less than a year, and uh, a large number of cross-border uh, commuters who may or may not um, be counted in the arrival statistics. So I've been pursuing you know, this number here. How many entries per year do we have? And my best guess is that there, prob there were probably well over 2 billion entries uh, in 2019, dropping to around a billion or so last year. And you know, from a security standpoint, um, it's these billions of border crossings that are a challenge for border control officials who attempt to identify the, the dangerous individuals within legitimate flows of, tra of travelers and migrants. Now, look, um, all of the world states exercise territorial sovereignty by adopting policies and enacting laws that require those who enter their territories to do so at designated uh, official border crossing points and official ports of entry. I mean, as far as I can tell, um, no state has an open border policy that allows any foreign national to enter its territory anywhere and at any time. States have established uh, coast guards and border guards to enforce these policies and laws by ensuring that international travelers, conveyances and cargo enter a state's territory through official border uh, crossing points where customs and immigration officials can conduct inspections. Now, <clears throat> border controls with respect to the entry of, of people uh, enforce immigration laws, criminal law, counterterrorism policies, and at times, uh, public health policies. But you know, in their, in their basic elements, you know, inspections of international travelers are really quite similar uh, around the world. In, primary, in the primary inspection process that most uh, travelers first encounter, an officer inspects the traveler's passport and may ask a few questions about you know, the plan, stay, employment, background. And then the officer either allows the traveler to enter or the officer, if they have some you know, reason to think that the travel documents are fraudulent or a watch list uh, check indicates some possible violation of immigration or criminal law or uh, suspicion of terrorist activity, uh, the officer may direct the traveler to a secondary inspection at which point the, the traveler might be more thoroughly uh, questioned, his or her documents more carefully scrutinized and personal effects uh, searched. Now, uh, during outbreaks of infectious diseases such as the coronavirus, travelers may be screened for symptoms in primary inspection and then uh, receive secondary inspection by uh, public health authorities who might also enforce uh, isolation or, or quarantines. Now, controls over people entering states, it's really only a part of border control. As uh, Ari Zolberg pointed out, 
uh, during the three and a half uh, century since the Treaty of Westphalia, states have been much, much more concerned uh, with emigration than immigration. However, uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, state policies restricting exit have decreased dramatically. In 2012, Cuba abolished uh, the exit permit requirement uh, of all of its citizens. And in 2019, Uzbekistan became uh, the last former Soviet Republic to abolish exit permits. In Singapore, uh, Taiwan, and South Korea, uh, conscription aged uh, males who have not yet completed their military service need to get an exit permit to leave the country. And as now we have seen uh, after uh, February 24th, uh, 18 to 60 year old Ukrainian men must likewise get some permission before leaving. Um, interestingly, Saudi Arabia requires exit permits um, <clears throat> of foreign workers uh, that confirm their fulfillment of their contracts with employers. Moreover, most states, border authorities inspect, inspect passports of departing travelers uh, primarily to determine whether or not they've abided by the terms of their visa, but also to stop fugitives from justice. <clears throat> now, look, uh, there's a, a tendency among migration scholars, uh, such as myself, to depict um, border control only in terms of controlling flows of people. But the world's border control authorities as a whole probably expend much, much more time and energy inspecting the cross-border flows of goods and conveyances uh, in order to um, enforce collection of customs duties. Oh, come on. There it is. Uh, customs duties. <clears throat> and then also to intercept contraband such as narcotics, uh, illegal weapons, uh, hazardous materials, um, as well as to stop agricultural pests and invasive species. Now, the collection of customs duties is much, much important, much more important to states of the developing world where customs and other import duties often comprise between about 10 and 60% of total tax revenues than to states that have relatively well functioning income tax uh, collections such as in the United States or value added uh, tax collection as for example, among EU member states. So although uh, border control authorities may be primarily focused on incoming shipments of goods, on the outbound uh, border control authorities also enforce um, export controls on dual use technologies uh, and certain materials that could be used to produce weapons of mass destruction. Uh, limitations on the amount of cash leaving a country, bans on the exports of antiquities and enforcement of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. So now, whether states have uh, policies to control borders is really, as I look at it, as a, it's an either or proposition, right? But a state's actual control of its borders is a matter of degree. Many states simply lack the capabilities to fully implement border controls and enforce the laws and regulations along all of their borders and at all official border crossing points. And then uh, some governments with sufficient capabilities may deliberately uh, opt for more, well, lax enforcement of laws and regulation uh, governing the entry so as to not impede uh, international trade or tourism. And now this happens uh, especially when businesses uh, dependent on trade or tourism uh, have significant political influence and can lobby governments to ease back on border control enforcement. Now, some states, well, they have a policy objective of achieving complete border control, whereby no single individual 
uh, crosses into the state without the state's authorization, as for example, the United States, right? You know, this was articulated back in 2006 in the Secure Fence Act. But in reality, right? No, uh, this idea of complete border control uh, is impossible. I mean, the only states that even came close to such border control uh, were totalitarian with uh, leaders who had really no qualms about imposing border control with shoot to kill orders, automated uh, machine guns and anti-personnel mines. And yet, as this indicates here, um, some of the numbers, uh, still people managed uh, to cross without authorization. So with this overview, with this foundation laid here, I'd like to ask you all uh, to join me in rethinking the relationship of globalization to uh, border control. So, <clears throat> you know, borders have become uh, metaphors in the conceptualization of uh, globalization and its relationship uh, to state sovereignty. Back in uh, 1990, the uh, business analyst Kenichi Oh my, he, he depicted globalization as uh, rapidly increasing international flows of capital goods um, and people. And he argued that the nation state was irrelevant, right? And then following up on that during the 1990s, academics like Arjun R. Potterai, uh, John Agnew, uh, Saskia Sassen, they uh, increasingly argued that the state was becoming uh, less relevant to cross-border flows. And international relations scholars like Lothar Brock um, and Matthias Albert refer to this process as de-bordering, right? Um, but then uh, the September 11th, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon uh, starkly uh, revealed a so-called dark side of globalization, right? So the global flows of uh, information over the internet and uh, international business travel and, and foreign study uh, provided a convenient cover for the 9-11 terrorists as they planned their attacks. And then in reaction to the attacks, what happens? The United States government really steps up, I mean, really steps up inspections of everything, of travelers, of trucks, everything at ports of entry. Here we see at the crossing um, between uh, Detroit and Windsor, Ontario. And in those trucks are a lot of parts for the factories in uh, Detroit, the car factories, which very quickly threatened to shut down. Um, and, you know, uh, in that context, Peter Andreas he started to talk about rebordering. And then other IR scholars interpreted this as a kind of reassertion of state sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis globalization. And then this uh, globalization debordering uh, narrative has increasingly been uh, countered through empirical analyses. Uh, for example, Rod Hasner, uh, Jason Wittenberg have provided an account of increasing construction of border fences around the world. But you know, building border fences is often an act of symbolic politics by politicians who, you know, they wanna demonstrate that they're doing something, right? About unauthorized migration. Um, but uh, the thing about it is, is that, uh, building more border fences does not necessarily equate with more border control. But now that's another presentation. Don't wanna get sidetracked too far. Um, but on the other hand, less fencing, less border fencing does not necessarily mean less border control. And in part, this is because states practices of border control along land borders is becoming less visible. Uh, due to more effective use of sensors, video, 
uh, satellites and drone surveillance, as explained in another paper that I won't get way laid into. But more importantly, um, border control has actually been taking place well beyond the territorial boundaries of states. Um, Ari Zolberg argued, and this has been going on for some time, he argued that beginning in the early 19th century, the United States began uh, what he called uh, having these remote controls to shape immigration flows. And for example, uh, in the late 19th century, a growing network of US consulates issued visas, like this one here that were increasingly required uh, for travel to the United States. And during World War I, visas became mandatory for all uh, travelers to the US. So these remote controls were intensified and expanded to such a degree after September 11, 2001, that I feel that this metaphor of globalization um, better captures how US authorities were being transformed at the time. So four months after the attack, the Bush administration um, said it would create the smart border of the future, which, quote, must integrate actions abroad to screen goods and people prior to their arrival in sovereign US territory, unquote. And of course, use advanced technology to accomplish this. So with respect to international trade, so think of it this way, um, discovering, figuring out that uh, there's a nuclear bomb in a container after it's arrived uh, in a US port is a bit too late, right? So the US customs uh, uh, agency at the time started something called the Container Security Initiative, which deployed US Customs and Border Protection officers abroad. Now they're in 58 ports where they pre-screen over 80% of all maritime containerized cargo imported into the United States. But in order for this kind of extraterritorial inspection to work, Customs and Border Protection, you know, they need to have information about um, what's inside the containers in order to determine uh, which ones should be x-rayed, which ones might need to be physically inspected in addition to that. So in 2002, the US Customs Service instituted a new regulation uh, requiring advanced electronic submission of cargo manifests 24 hours in advance of when those containers will be loaded on the ships bound uh, for the US. Now, this container security initiative uh, was also reciprocal. So Canadian inspectors were deployed to Newark and Seattle, Japanese inspectors to Los Angeles, Long Beach, and many other countries have also pushed their borders out by requiring this electronic submission of detailed data about the shipments before those shipments uh, depart. Now, US government also uh, pushed borders out with respect to international travel, including things like um, deputizing uh, private uh, airline agents to inspect the travel documents of US bound passengers, uh, collecting biometric entry exit data uh, to better identify the travelers uh, and detect uh, fraud, track visitor uh, cross border movements, and also another kind of forward deployment of personnel. So there are 600 US Customs and Border Protection agents stationed at 15 airports um, in six countries. And uh, in 2016, they pre-cleared 18 million travelers, which constitute about 15% of all the travelers arriving to the US by commercial airlines. Now, the airlines are also required to submit um, advanced passenger information or API and passenger name record data or PNR for analysis. Now, API is data about the traveler, name, date of birth, passport number. PNR is information that the traveler provides you know, when booking a flight with the airline. So address, credit card, uh, preferences for meals. Um, 
over 70 states require uh, passenger data from airlines before departure and use it to screen incoming uh, travelers. For example, <clears throat> Australian border control authorities, uh, they told me back in uh, 2006 that they have, well, at least six hours or so to analyze advanced passenger information and passenger name record data on most of the travelers before they arrive. And uh, this gives the border control officers plenty of time to run this information against the movement alert list, a computer database that stores uh, biographical details and identities and travel documents of concern to Australian authorities. And it now includes 700,000 identities of interest. So border control officers usually determine which arriving travelers will be taken aside hours before they ever set foot on Australian territory. Well, the upshot here is that over the past two decades, um, the actual practices of border control are increasingly taking place in global cyberspace, right? Rather than along that thin line of the territorial borders between states that we think of as borders. So after the 9-11 um, attacks, UN member states gave their border control authorities marching orders to increase border security while at the same time facilitating trade and travel flows. Right? Overall, border control authorities, they appear to be, have been quite successful in achieving this mission. Again, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but no weapons of mass destruction, or radiological weapons, or even conventional explosive, again, that I'm aware of, have ever been detonated in a target state after importation in a shipping container. And then, um, you know, other than the attacks on Syria and Iraq by foreign fighters recruited by ISIS, there have been relatively few lethal terrorist attacks committed by foreign nationals on short-term visas, like the 9-11 hijackers, right? 17 of whom were on tourist visa, one business visa, one student visa. You know, all the while, international trade and travel has been increasing in absolute and relative uh, terms. So in uh, 2001, merchandise uh, imports dropped $300 million, but um, imports rebounded to pre-9-11 levels within two years. Since then, merchandise imports uh, steadily increased until the 2008 financial crisis and Great Recession. Uh, and then 10 years later, peaked uh, at $19.9 trillion. And then now had dropped $2 trillion during the pandemic uh, to $17.9 trillion. But international trade dropped due to you know, pandemic-related declines in economic activity. I mean, it wasn't due to border controls excessively increasing import costs relative to substitution. Uh, by domestic products, all right? So international travel uh, as reflected in the increase in tourist arrivals worldwide an even steadier increase, well, until uh, COVID-19, the pandemic began in, in 2020. But I would suggest all in all over the past uh, two decades, state strategies to push their borders out have enabled considerable increases in international trade and actually accelerating increases in international travel. So if the two, two of the main indicators of globalization are increasing cross-border movements of goods and people, I mean, it appears that globalization has been facilitated by border controls that have been improved by data collection um, and international cooperation. So 
more effective border controls might be better understood as another aspect of globalization rather than its decline. Indeed, uh, contemporary border control practices are actually driving increasing international cooperation and global governance rather than representing an assertion of state sovereignty. And it's to that cooperation that I now like to turn. So we're halfway there, okay? Third part here on multilateral cooperation. Um, so international cooperation on uh, border control can be bilateral or multilateral in nature. It might be on the control of uh, goods or people. Um, it may be with respect to entry or to exit from a country. So the third step here of my argument is basically devoted to the development of multilateral cooperation on the cross-border movement of people focusing on their entry, right? So the uh, cooperation uh, to facilitate international travel, I mean, it reaches back to the 1920 uh, Paris Conference on Passports and Customs uh, Formalities. The uh, standardization of passports it then continued on after World War II with the formation of the International Civil Aviation Organization in 1947, which subsequently promoted the uh, standards of machine readable passports uh, in the 1980s. And so cooperation within ICAO and the UN World Tourism Organization historically has focused on facilitating uh, movements of tourists and business people reflected in that increase that we saw um, in, in tourist arrivals. However, um, states have increasingly turned to international cooperation to secure travel in addition to facilitation. So for example, um, in the 2000 UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crimes, uh, protocol against the smuggling of migrants. It calls on states to intensify uh, their cooperation among border control uh, agencies. And then within weeks of the September 11th, the 2001 attacks, the UN Security Council issued, ah, thank you, reading my mind. <laughs> or hearing my voice become more and more raspy. <laughs> Um, uh, resolution 13, uh, sorry, 1373, uh, which uh, called on UN member states to improve border controls and their identity uh, documents to combat terrorist travel. Uh, states cooperate to establish Interpol's a stolen and lost travel documents database. That includes the records of some 75 million stolen and lost travel documents from 175 countries. Uh, the 193 member states of ICAO agreed to standards for e-passports with digitized biometrics that reduced uh, passport fraud. Um, there's an estimated 150 states that have issued e-passports with over a billion e-passports in circulation. Now, International cooperation on travel security on the global level really built on regional cooperation, which really has been taken uh, to its high, highest level in the European Union with the 1990 Schengen Convention, the 1992 Maastricht Treaty's third pillar on cooperation in justice and home affairs, uh, the European Commission uh, Directorate General for Migration and Home Affairs, and the formation of Frontex the uh, European Border and Coast Guard, which essentially coordinates EU member states' uh, considerable uh, border control capabilities. So uh, Frontex estimated back in uh, 2010 that EU member states had 400,000 border guards and police officers involved in border manage, the vast majority of whom practice integrated uh, border management, the other IBM, and they follow the, the Schengen uh, border code. Now, such uh, EU cooperation and this abundance 
of management, administrative, technical, and law enforcement capacity really prepared EU member states for cooperation with third countries in mobility partnerships, again, between the EU and uh, neighboring states, as well as a variety of interregional uh, groupings. For example, in transatlantic uh, cooperation between uh, the US and the EU. So when uh, in 2001, US customs, like right after the September 11th attacks, began to demand passenger uh, name record data from European airlines landing in the US. They were, those airlines were really caught uh, between a rock and a hard place because of European data protection rules forbid such sharing of data. So the Department of Homeland Security and the European Commission hammered out a series of arrangements and agreements. And even though there were hiccups with the European Parliament, et cetera, and, uh, but guess what? The data just kept flowing, never stopped. And it goes both ways. Now, partly motivated by the fact that Canada and Australia also passed legislation requiring submission of PNR data, European Commission opted to take a global approach and proposed uh, internet, an international framework for the transfer of PNR data. So ICAO then subsequently developed a set of guidelines for PNR data transfer that went into effect as a recommended practice in 2005. And then in 2017, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 2396, which called for the collection and sharing of PNR data by all UN member states uh, to combat terrorist travel. So, so to my last section of the talk here, the Global Compact for Migration really expands the scope of this cooperation that I've just been telling you about uh, to secure international travel and push, allow states to push their border controls uh, beyond their territorial boundaries. You know, although many people may think that uh, a global compact for migration should increase migration flows, I mean, the objectives are clearly articulated uh, in the agreement's full name that we see up here. The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. I mean, from the standpoint of UN member states that agreed to the Global Compact, safe migration means uh, traveling in properly maintained and inspected vehicles, airplanes, ships, and then entering countries through official ports of entry, not crossing scorching deserts to get around official border crossing points or crossing dangerous seas and overloaded boats. Um, orderly migration means entry in numbers and that rates that migrants can be properly vetted by consular officers and inspected at ports of entry, not in chaotic charges through official border crossing points that overwhelm local officials and communities. And uh, regular migration is migration that is authorized by the destination states, not unauthorized border crossings or uh, visa overstaying. So the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, yet again sets out a cooperative framework comprised of 23 objectives, each of which contains one or more commitments to be realized by, quote, actions considered to be relevant policy instruments or best practices, unquote. Global Compact is not a legally binding convention and it explicitly reaffirms state sovereignty over immigration policy. The Global Compact is, for migration is rather a a vehicle for states to collectively make commitments and then track the implementation uh, of those uh, commitments. Now, here's the thing. Uh, eight of the compact's 23 objectives are directly related to security. 
Although many migration origin states may have uh, signed and ratified the transnational crime conventions protocols on migrant smuggling, and, and maybe uh, they've agreed to ICAO uh, standards on machine readable travel documents. What the Global Compact does is that it expands the scope for such uh, cooperation by specifically enjoining all of the states that voted for it to improve their identity processes and travel documents and collect all of the necessary data from travelers and migrants to accomplish these objectives, uh, to coordinate their management of border security, uh, to cooperate in return and readmission of their own nationals deemed inadmissible by other states. So uh, some 35 uh, UN member states uh, that were not parties to the anti-smuggling protocol voted for the Global Compact. So in this way, the Global Compact uh, for Migration increased the number of states committing to information sharing and border cross-border law enforcement to combat human smuggling and prevent irregular migration. Uh, the Global Compact specifically recommends actions such as issue travel documents according to ICAO standards, combat identity fraud and document forgery, invest in digitalization, improve biometric data sharing. So, you know, here we see almost 80% of the world states take on commitments that acknowledge the necessity of investing in new information and communications technologies to reduce fraudulent identity and travel documents. For example, 64 UN member states joined the Global Compact uh, that had joined had not yet issued uh, e-passports. So by adopting the Global Compact for Migration, many migrant origin states have demonstrated their willingness to invest in their capacities to control their borders and to combat human smuggling and to facilitate return and readmission. So I'd like to uh, conclude uh, with a few thoughts about potential consequences of all this cooperation that we're seeing around the world. So generally speaking, you know, and uh, again, I teach international relations and international cooperation is, you know, generally associated with the liberal world order, right? Uh, and with liberal outcomes, such as increasing international trade and monetary flows. Uh, however, in international cooperation uh, on migration does not necessarily lead to more migration. While the global compact for migration may increase the percentage of the world's migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees who cross borders in a safe, orderly, and regular manner, the total number of migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees may simultaneously be lower than if the global compact did not come into being. The impact of the global compact is, is really contingent on which parts of the compact that states opt to implement. Right? Um, and the non-binding nature of the agreement and the abundance of its commitments to increase border control actually gives states an opportunity to pursue intensified international cooperation to secure borders while simultaneously failing uh, to take actions that would realize commitments uh, to improve the conditions of migrant workers, asylum seekers, and refugees. I mean, uh, given that uh, spontaneous arrival asylum applications on a state's territory are largely the function of weak or sloppy border controls and the lack of cooperation among states, by increasing international cooperation to improve uh, border controls, uh, the, uh, what do we got here? <laughs> I'll let you take it. <laughs> okay. Cancel? Yes, all right, perfect. that's all we need. <laughs> uh, so 
uh, increasing cooperation to improve uh, the border controls, it, it may actually, the global compact may actually um, hinder uh, the escape from violence and persecution, right? So uh, looking forward toward the future of more technologies applied to border controls, more secure documents, um, more information sharing and international cooperation among growing ranks of border guards and more effective inspection processes. We can anticipate uh, declines in uh, spontaneous uh, arrival asylum applications. I mean, if those people with well-founded fears of persecution are to be protected, um, increasing international cooperation on border uh, controls must be complemented with more cooperation on refugee resettlement, more cooperation to fund humanitarian assistance for countries of first asylum, and of course, to provide protection to persons displaced within uh, their own countries. So uh, with that, I'm just going to put a list here of the publications that I drew on uh, for, this, uh, for this paper that I'm writing. And uh, thanks for the opportunity again. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Stop the share. Oh, gosh. The double picture, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> that's a mess. Um, the tendency of states to exclude people from the possible possibilities to enter, especially people who are in danger and mm -hmm. are active. For instance, in Lebanon, where the state completely excludes people from any rights who enter from Syria. Is that not something that has nothing to do with the principles of the global compact, the two compacts, but actually with a, a, a non-intended side effect? That's exactly it. Uh, that's the way I, I framed this in a previous piece, this we hope unintended side effect, okay, of this cooperation. Political games. Yeah, um, but yeah, the Global Compact, there are also all sorts of references to human rights, right? All sorts of commitments to facilitating movement, uh, circular migration, essentially, legal pathways, all of things, things are mentioned. But what it comes down to is which parts of the global compact are going to be implemented by states, right? So, and it was really interesting too, in some of the debates, uh, I remember I was looking through some of the records of the Intergovernmental Conference and, and Denmark had, you know, interjected and wanted to be, to make sure and make, make it clear that um, all of these different objectives were not in toto, right? That uh, they were essentially states could selectively opt into um, actions. Again, there are actions to realize the commitments. There's a big laundry list. If you look at the compact, I mean, there are more, all of these actions that are listed, but many of those actions, you know, aren't going to be taken, <laughs> right, in certain areas. But there are all these other ones, all these other actions that I would suggest in under the security, those uh, items, those objectives that have been and are increasingly um, being undertaken. But, you know, say for uh, those, the other set of uh, objectives, a lot of them, I really view it as uh, a whole host of objectives that are around this idea of having more circular migration and facilitating that. Um, you know, to what extent these schemes, these migrant worker schemes have been put in place, and especially in the context of COVID, you know, we haven't seen that, 
right? And that now becomes the main feature of the debate here. Now we have the conference has just finished up for the uh, implementation, the review of what's been done. There's been quite a bit of a focus on COVID and what couldn't be done because of it. So the upshot is, yeah, it's in there. <laughs> But, Especially on the refugees, of course. Yeah, well, this is the other thing about the, the global compact for migration, right? There uh, was a, 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 an avowed agreement to have it two compacts. So one for migration and the global compact on refugees. Global compact on refugees done in Geneva, you know, kind of under the watchful eye of UNHCR. I think, again, UNHCR was concerned about this process to begin with and what it might lead to. Global Compact for Migration in New York, the more political showy part, shall we say. And so, you know, there's, you know, kind of very um, tangential references made, but again, that's the other compact. That's the way in which, you know, that, that figures from in the way in which it was discussed, et cetera. So this compact could have all sorts of unintended side effects, especially if the other compact doesn't achieve some of the um, uh, kinds of uh, sharing of responsibility that's supposed to happen from it, right? Which I haven't seen too much of yet either. Yeah. Um. It's really great to see the next iteration of this project. Like, and, um, I've uh, really enjoyed following your work on mobility regimes and, and how much it's added a critical perspective to looking at global migration and governance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether uh, some of your work might be, particularly the critical dimension of it, might be helped along by hanging out a little bit with anthropologists and sociologists. <laughs> and, and um, yeah. I say this because in the image of international order that you create, it's very much um, an IR one, and I'm not blaming yes. you. Uh, like, I'm, I can't the, help like, myself. Yes. Like, <laughs> so it's very much the, it's that international order is created in New York and Geneva, and then it's a question of whether it gets implemented or not. Mm -hmm. Whereas the people who spend their time looking in the other direction mm -hmm. at the implementation, right. and then trying to get, you know, to glean their understanding, you know, develop an understanding of this order from the ground up through mm -hmm. practice by observing these things up close, mm -hmm. do have theories of what it looks like. And it involves things like, you know, Hank Van Houten on sedentarization mm -hmm. or Nicholas de Genova on the class structure of the international regime. Others mm -hmm. work with concepts of race. Gelbertoff Hansen and Sirac mm -hmm. on the migration industry and rent seeking. Like these sure. sorts of things have, you know, I think ways of saying, well, it's not about whether or not these liberal principles get implemented or not. If we look at implementation, there are clear principles, right, that govern how this mm -hmm. system works. And we could, um, if we start there, we start to get a very different image of something perhaps more coherent than could ever be produced in a, in a document, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this one, one of the fear. Oh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm very much in, uh, in line with this ground up approach. And, and just to say much of what um, led to this, and I, I mentioned, you know, 2006, that was a time I spent uh, traveling a uh, year uh, around uh, Europe, quite a bit interviewing uh, border guards, asking them about the technology that they use, and also you know, to Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, or so. And that's where I actually got a sense for some of this in terms of uh, the limitations and the potential uh, for some of the techniques and tools, and you know uh, the routinization. That was the other thing about the integrated border management that, um, again, European border guards had, in a sense, collectively brought in and, and were teaching worldwide, right? So that's another thing that's going on here. Uh, 
and uh, and seeing that at IKO meetings too, which was quite interesting in terms of uh, the uh, spread of biometrics worldwide. And and uh, um, I still can remember talking with uh, the Interior Ministry of Bangladesh and uh, and the Colonel, or no, he was a general who was supposed to implement their e-passport program in the next two months, for example. It, and, and, and again, this is quite some time ago, seeing uh, these processes coming in place. Um, and again, uh, I, I view this as uh, uh, routine activities of state, of a state, and what states, and again, from the perspective of, of the states, if you will, granted, right, very much. Uh, in, 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 a, in a political science, international relations, you know, standard. But I am cognizant that in terms of how practices might be uh, learned from each other through, uh, again, in some of the um, sociologists who look at professions, for example, and, and how norms are shared. I mean, you could see it happening to a certain extent in some of these meetings, for example. Um, so yes, that, that is there. I guess I would say that I'm, you know, approaching this for different theoretical uh, purposes. All right, I don't know, you know, how many of my colleagues because, you know, I, I run into problems then if I'm trying to publish this in in our journals, right? <laughs> and, and quite frankly, a lot of for the longest time in international relations, particularly, nobody cared about migration, right? So. Um, you know, these things that in sociology and anthropology, you know, were, were really center of the discipline. I mean, you know, International uh, Sociological Association, a whole migration section, right? Uh, not so much in political science. So in a way, I've tried to bring in some of these ideas to more, uh, how shall we say, um, traditional uh, international relations scholarship. A uh, same thing with immigrant participation in home country politics, right? The transnationalism, right? Uh, trying to bring that to also an audience of people in my discipline. Um, unfortunately, I think that the way it became important in IR was 9-11. That, that was it. You know, suddenly everybody cared, but for all the wrong reasons, right? Um, Anyway, droning on here a little bit, but you got me to, <laughs> you got me going on this. Look, uh, I'm with you on it in, in many ways, but uh, then I might have to, if I start writing about uh, these theories and contributing to these debates, I'll have to be hanging out with y'all much, much more. <laughs> You'll have to publish my stuff in your journals too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I just came off the you know, the board of EKR and yeah. like a lot of that work. Yeah, it's, 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 it's wonderful. Yeah, that, it's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, things have changed dramatically. Yeah, yeah. They really have. And here in Europe too, that's the other thing. There's another North yeah, American so. European IR issue here yeah, that yeah. we have that, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you had on, on that one slide where you kind of put out your maybe uh, uh, prime questions on how to re reimagine mobility and mm -hmm. globalization. Uh, one of the things uh, you wrote was maybe um, state controls, uh, this cooperation of state controls is. Um, one of the drivers of globalization, mm -hmm. one of the um, maybe conditions of how globalization comes about. Um, I'm drivers of um, facilitating globalization. I think that's what you yeah. And so I wondered a bit about what you think might be maybe the state logic, if you will, that, that drives this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, do, do state actors need to be convinced of the uh, advantages of increased cooperation by selling it uh, through security 
um, terms, maybe, or mm -hmm. are they more interested in uh, cooperating on security and then the rest kind of comes in through the back door? Or do states see it as we can only cooperate if we already have security in place? I wonder if there's kind of a, <laughs> yeah, if there's a balance or if it so this is kind of another step here. So my, my argument was more a matter of the way in which uh, people argue that these instances, increasing border control is somehow or another a reassertion of state sovereignty. Okay. And I'm suggesting that it's not really, not in the way that you're trying to make it out. Again, it's more kind of symbolic politics. Let's point at all the fences. Ooh, you know, globalization's over. Forget about that. That's all over. That's 90s stuff, right? This is the new world we're in. And I would suggest, no, it's not. I mean, if again, just looking at the flows, the continuation of the flows. Now, as to why states embrace globalization, that's another issue, right? And this has more to do with uh, the, uh, the business interests, the, the powers that be within states that want to increase trade, that want to increase international financial flows, that want to, in essence, also increase uh, mobility. Okay. So it's the whoever it is that wants to increase trade in those states, I think they're the same folks, okay, um, who want to increase that mobility. All right. But I think what you were pointing to is where I was saying that, in a sense, uh, this kind of globalization of border controls is actually uh, increasing internet is increasing global governance, right? So, but if you look at this activity, right, all of this activity of states cooperating with each other on a regional level, on uh, you know trans-regional levels the US and EU, et cetera. And then now at the global level, it's a whole lot of more global governance. I mean, it's, I mean, global governance is global governance, regardless of the purpose is the way I would put it, right? If states are cooperating and there are more and more actors engaged in it. Um, and there are also non-state actors engaged with it, with it, but it's not necessarily the human rights NGOs, right? It's going to be a lot of the businesses that sell the technology that are at those meetings, right? Of those groups. So it's a bit different, right? Um, so it's that there is through this globalization of border controls, there's actually more of the things that people think about when they think about the cooperation on, on trade, for example, right? So there's also that that's what's typically also pointed to in terms of increasing global governance, for example. Same here. It just uh, nominally looks like putting up fences and borders. <laughs> and on the face of it, maybe that's what it, you know, it is in a way, but I would suggest that uh, much of that is uh, relatively less effective symbolic politics as opposed to what's really going on. You suggested that all this actually does make things safer. Because there is no atomic bomb in the container yet. Arrived. That one so far, yeah. Um, but is this not false, false security uh, theory? OK. Because, um, I think you, you spoke about this privately. That, that, it's not so much about the passport, it's about the documents that underlie the issuing of the passport. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you just you are from the British National, right? No, I'm originally German. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but also, but I'm based in the UK. Don't you worry about the crime in the passport? I think you need somebody to testify that you are you and then you get your passport. Oh God, yeah, it's horrible. And not having a passport makes things very difficult. Yeah, and for example, I can't pay my taxes. <laughs> That's so usually something the passport. state is making a big mistake on that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> they, you know, I gave overcharge, and now I need to declare my taxes to get that money back, but I can't because I don't have a passport. So I need various trustworthy people. For example, the uh, president of my Oxford College 
to vouch for me that I actually exist and am who I claim to be. Yeah, it's open to more corruption and handling of secret services and whatnot. Um, so my question to you would be how far can we is this an issue? Uh, security open so I guess before. And the second is how we because can also like how important this actually is. I mean the fact that I am not know it and my address is known with yeah, yeah. the yes that means. Um, it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. who I am or where I live. Mm -hmm. For, for, for the fact that I want to travel to the US. Yeah. Well, I think the, the key issue and what much of this cooperation was around was uh, uh, essentially in a kind of a different time frame, right? You have to think about uh, in uh, you know the 1990s and early 2000s, it was still possible to uh, basically uh, slice the passport open. It was the, you know, this layer of plastic over a passport photo that you got in a booth, you know, or some uh, photographer gave you, and and then you know, you, people used to put in different photo, and and th and they would get through uh, passport controls like that, or better yet, camouflage passports, you know, uh, uh, passports from uh, Rhodesia or from South Vietnam. And, and the problem was is that uh, airline agents were deputized to inspect travel documents and say, we should get on the plane. And, and since their geography and history might not always be the greatest, well, it looked pretty good, right? So you have to just keep in mind how loose things were. Um, as far as containerized freight, well, <laughs> it used to come and uh, the, uh, manifests would say things like FAK, freight all kind. That's it. Um, household goods. <laughs> Boom. And it come in big, you know, like papers, wads of paper with the container. And so, you know, if there was some suspicion about this, uh, you know, and, and where the container came and et cetera, et cetera. So much of what was done initially, and particularly with respect to that early transfer of data, was digitalization, moving from paper documents, and, and documents, again, would be susceptible to counterfeit all right, and fraud to digital uh, manifestations that would be much harder. Uh, so the um, biometric e-passport, I mean, the key thing is, is that well, it even happened before the, uh, the chip on it. It was the machine readable zone, which would provide uh, the, the possibility of getting the data from the passport into the computer. Because otherwise, before that, I mean, Beauregard's had big lists of, of names of, you know, bad guys. And, and, and they'd have to look at this list and, or try to memorize it, right? So it was really difficult. So machine readable passports enabled uh, the effective screening. And then uh, the, the chip, all right, having essentially the photo, that's the biometric, having that photo on the chip meant that you can't slip in a new one, even if you're able to do, in some cases, it happened very quickly with digitized photos, even they were able to photo substitute. But once you have the chip, you can't do that. So it makes the document more secure the chip is red, it populates the database, up comes the picture. Yeah, that's the same picture. So it made the document more secure. But the problem, as you mentioned here, was the breeder documents. Uh, so for example, the US passport depends on, um, you know, a birth certificate. And uh, that's how, and I'm gonna have to renew my passport again. So I'll send it in with an official copy of my birth certificate that I'll get uh, from the state of Pennsylvania. Now the thing about it is, is that not all states have <laughs> uh, require a proof of identity um, to get an official copy of the birth certificate. Um, and then some like New York require two um, bills from utilities in your name at the address. That's, at least they've got something, okay? Uh, but as the uh, general, uh, the Government Accountability Office did this uh, um, 
testing of the system. And some you know, fellow there, he got four passports, sadly from with New York fake birth certificates and uh, in four different names and was able to go past TSA using one of them. So a genuine US passport. So it's more those administrative processes that can easily be um, manipulated. So it's not just the technology, right? It's the whole administrative process behind that particular identity document. Uh, and, and, you know, things are different in the European Union where you've got actually have identity documents as opposed to the United States where we use our driver's license uh, for that purpose. But, you know, it leads to this whole question about, you know, how far do you go and how far can you go to actually uh, uh, attain the kinds of uh, security that you're looking for? Because that's a kind of cat and mouse game between the officials, the authorities, and uh, the document counterfeiters and the human smugglers, right? And of course, how much people are willing to pay for the fraudulent document or the fraudulently acquired genuine documents, right? I know, I'm sorry, that was a kind of a long uh, <laughs> uh, roundabout way, but I hope I got to that issue here. No, there's no complete security, <laughs> let me put you that way. It all depends on uh, you know, what the opponents, if you will, in any particular uh, enforcement process uh, are able to counter with and how much each side is willing to invest in the process and also in inconveniencing uh, their citizens, their nationals. But there's also the problem of once you enter the system mm -hmm. under a certain identity, oh, well then then it's, it's wrong. Then it's a big problem. And they're, they're doing, for instance, when I acquired an American uh, driver's license, I was sitting there and I was typing from my mm -hmm. passport, and he turned me into a room, thanks to that. This was in the password, the issue by the mayor of Amsterdam, and he somehow interpreted this to mean that that was my last name. Um, I corrected it, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, <laughs> could have had a nifty stage name. Right. <laughs> but that, that's how well, mistakes are being made. You know? and, and, uh, believe me, there are many people whose names were given oh, to them oh, by their, uh, the officials who were at Ellis Island and interacted with their grandparents, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that, that is, you know, part of the social construction of identities too, right? That's the interaction with officials in um, establishing what that identity is and, and mistakes. Yes, they have been made. They are very difficult to change too. And of course, you can also steal someone's identity. And then really Absolutely. And that's and one of the things that's happening now with all the digitalization is that, look, I mean, <laughs> my uh, name, date of birth, social security number, all sorts of information about me can be purchased on, you know, some dark website or something where people uh, sell these things for, as I understand it, something like five dollars. All right. I've been informed of this by, you know, uh, one of the security packages I got because some of my data was compromised by a vendor, right? So, oh, great, that's good to know. <laughs> but that's the reality that we're living in now is that all of, as we engage with all sorts of uh, convenient means of buying things and, uh, and doing things, there are a whole lot of other people out there who are figuring out ways in which they can steal that information and charge $13,000 to your credit card, which is what happened to me. Um, <laughs> I did a whole lot of buying stuff in, in Mexico that I wasn't aware of that I was doing in one day in so many places, but you know, it happens. Um, uh, and so uh, again, that's partly uh, with, with the processes of insurance and uh, those companies that are monitoring that information 
they're always just a, a step ahead, hopefully, of the people who are trying to steal it. But we're more and more susceptible to this. And, you know, uh, we're also uh, sharing all sorts of passport information. And, and uh, um, you know, there's a question of how that might be utilized. And um, I've always wondered about that. And also more biometrics other than the facial biometric, how that might be compromised. And once that's compromised, what it might mean for the utility of those biometrics. They might be more of a one-shot deal. I have a question. Um, you talked about the expansion of the borders outwards of the actual borders, but wouldn't you also say that there's also a bleeding in of the borders? Because um, I know, for example, from the US that you are subject to border control um, into a certain area of the country. And only when you are actually outside of that area, then you are not really any more affected of the borders. Okay. So, well, let me frame this first. So when I'm talking about pushing borders out, I'm mostly speaking about um, uh, people who are entering through uh, via air or sea and uh, this inspection that take, takes place abroad, right? When we're talking about uh, land borders, and that's a different jurisdiction, that's the US Border Patrol. Part of Customs and Border Protection. And what custom, what the uh, Border Patrol uh, ostensibly, you know, they can't really work in Mexico. So they work just on this side of the border for the most part. But their zone of operation is deep. Uh, and you have to think in terms of less populated areas. It's quite less deep. But as you point out, 150 miles gets you pretty far in upstate New York, where I live. So with the northern border of Canada, all the cities along the northern border, again, are subject to the same set of rules that the Border Patrol has in you know, the Sonoran Desert of Arizona. And uh, that just basically gives jurisdiction for the Border Patrol to operate. And so just as in New Mexico, for example, uh, there are, uh, the Border Patrol may stop all vehicles and you know people have to uh, show their documents or say, yeah, I'm a citizen or whatever, that's what usually happens. Um, you know, they can have those traffic spots, the stops, they're authorized to do that. So in the same sense, and this became controversial, they started uh, stopping Greyhound buses and people on Greyhound buses and asking them about their uh, citizenship, et cetera. So it's, that's fairly specific here, but there's internal enforcement too. Uh, so the Immigration Customs Enforcement, another branch of DHS, which operates throughout the country. Um, but you know, that should be very understandable in Europe because Europe and, and Germany and many other countries here, this is, again, border control takes place at all train stations, anywhere, really. Yeah, I've been, I've been uh, stopped in buses, et cetera, as well in Germany, coming from the Czech Republic, for example. Uh, but, you know, there's a deep, deep zone of potential operation. And remember that figure of 400,000 border guards and police with border management responsibilities, All right? So many of the police are in a sense deputized to work with the interior ministry on border issues as well. So I would say that the United States is, uh, how shall we say? similar, but not even close to uh, European capabilities for internal enforcement. Because we also have uh, cities and states that opt out of cooperation with immigration customs enforcement. I don't know if a very many German lender opt out 
or have out of the doubt, for example. But there's lots of discretion in the German system. Yeah. Now, what happens if you turn out to be an undocumented migrant, uh, or rather an irregular migrant? Mm -hmm. so, then it depends on which uh, official you run into. Oh, if, yeah. If, if, if you will be granted the dulu to tolerate the yeah. status, or you will actually be expelled. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, the Germans, and as I understand it, there's also as a long uh, tradition of, how shall we say, administrative regularization <laughs> that has occurred. So unlike the, the Spanish and Italian mass regularizations, you know, in Germany, they, they quietly regularize. So yeah, yeah, uh, it's not the case. But then then it depends on that kind of individual discretion. It's individual look state for one it's not the state, state or the city or government. Depends on how that official felt waking up in the morning. Got up on the right side of the bed. <laughs> There's a little of that. Yeah. I, I, there are no further questions. No questions. And I don't think we have any uh -huh. questions from outside. No. And, uh, Ray, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you like all for coming out uh, for an in-person, my first in-person uh, event, <laughs> uh, other than teaching my course. But uh, so it's been great. Thanks a lot.